October 1st, 1962 is a day I'll always remember. I was 36 years old, taking my place as host of America's most popular late-night program, The Tonight Show. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. This is kind of an emotional thing for me because I've known about this show for a long time. And the newspapers and the magazines, and I've probably been interviewed 150 times in the last nine months since I've known about this. And as I say, you work up to it. We come over here this afternoon, we meet the guests that are on the show, and you get kind of charged up. I don't mean to be maudlin about it, but I know that tonight a lot of people, a lot of my friends are watching all over the country. And I only have one feeling as I, I stand here knowing that so many people are watching. I want my man <laughs> Well, I made it through that first night with the help of Groucho Marx, Rudy Valley, Joan Crawford, Tony Bennett, and Mel Brooks. I could never have imagined I would walk through that curtain almost 5,000 times in 30 years. The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. And now, here's Johnny! All right, it's Dave Player here on 720 WGN. So this Sunday marks the 30th anniversary of Johnny Carson's final Tonight Show after nearly 30 years on the air. It was May 22nd, 1992, with Johnny presenting a retrospective of clips covering three decades as the king of late night. There were no guests, and the audience had to receive an invitation to be there. 50 million people tuned in to watch the send-off, and there's one man that knew Johnny very well, and that is his nephew, Jeff Satsing, who also is the president of of Carson Entertainment, and he joins us tonight. Jeff, welcome in. You know, it was 1962 when Johnny Carson took over The Tonight Show for Jack Parr. After months and months and a variety of guest hosts stepped in, there was a lot of anticipation here. Basically, there was a a number of guest hosts because at the time he was the host of Who Do You Trust? A game show on AB. Yeah, and they wouldn't let him out of his contract for six months, so they had to fill, fill in for six months, which... I think it was good because uh, by the time he got there, people were ready for something different, and uh, he was a fresh face. It was a, it was a, actually it turned out to be fantastic for him. There was a lot of anticipation and a lot of talk and a lot of media talk about Johnny taking over that show. Well, in huge shoes to fill. Jack Parr was such an iconic figure. I mean, who's going to be able to replace Jack? So it was that was that was not an easy thing for him to do. And I know he launched the show in New York, which now after watching um, a color clip um, of right. the Tonight Show. I see that Fallon uses a similar blue curtain that was behind Johnny those first years in New York, which maybe that's a little nod to him. Well, and that that show, the Fallon show, was in the actual studio uh, that Johnny was in when he was in New York between 62 and 72. Wow. That's very cool. Yeah, 6B. Yeah, it's very cool. Now, the early episodes are a little more rare, but when I watch them now, even the 90-minute episodes, i got to tell you, and I know you know this, Johnny was a master at his craft and what he did, bouncing from two to three top celebrities of the day, comedians, politicians, musicians, authors, everyday people, sometimes all in the same show. When I sit there and I watch it and I think, boy, that's a long time to watch a show, 90 minutes, It's I, I'm, I'm sad when it's over. Oh, well, that's great to hear. And it is, it, is easy, it is really, really difficult to do and make it look easy. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Now, I know you worked for him, uh, with him for years. Um, when did you start the relationship on air? Now, were you ever part of the New York days, or did that come, because you're a young guy, did that come in really when they moved to uh, to California? No, you know, I grew up in, in Philadelphia, so, you know, like my earliest memories of The Tonight Show was uh, in 1961, where uh, one morning I woke up and there was this guy sleeping on our couch, and I said to my mom, who's that? And she said, that's your Uncle Dick from California. He's come out to the East Coast, and he's going to, direct the tonight show and your uncle john is going to be the, the host of the tonight show <laughs> <He's sleeping on laughs> the so that's a pretty good deal one one of my uncles is the host of the tonight show and the other one is the director and uh you know all through my uh, junior high and high school if i wanted to go and see the temptations or aretha franklin i'd jump on the train from philadelphia and go to new york and sit in the audience and watch rehearsal and 
you had to be 16 to see the show, so I couldn't see the show, but I could sit in the booth with, with Dick Carson, and uh, I watched the show for years and years and years, and when it moved to the, the West Coast, I had actually gone into the service, and when I got out of the service, I moved to the West Coast, and I started in, uh, like, 1978. Now, how did that conversation go with your Uncle Johnny about this? Was this something that he knew you wanted to do and said, hey, Jeff, let's uh, let's give this a shot. Why don't you come work on the show? How did that all come about? Well, you know, I, as I say, I loved the show as a kid, and I'd always go and watch rehearsal, and then after the show, we'd go backstage. Usually my dad would take me, or I'd go by myself when I got older and see Uncle John and, you know, talk about show business. And I had actually gone to Pasadena City College, and I was studying videotape editing, and, you know, we always had Christmas and Thanksgiving and, you know, barbecues, family get-togethers. And at Christmas, he said to me, what are you doing? And I told him that I had been studying to be a videotape editor, and I'd been there for a couple of years. And a few months later, he called my mom and said, do you think Jeff would want to work on The Tonight Show as the receptionist? So my first job was, you know, sorting the mail, getting all the taking calls. And uh, he said, it'll be a great way for you to learn everybody. You'll know everybody's business. And, uh, you know, you just do it for the summer. And I said, terrific and and i never left wow i mean just think about that i mean this is you know your uncle but one of the most powerful men on television and it was at a time where what do we have three channels four or five maybe a couple uhf outlets so everybody was watching the show i mean it's at its height 15 million people 18 million people watching the show every night oh more more like 30 30 million i mean we yeah, when we did, you know, my uh, jobs that I had towards the end of my run was uh, associate producer and producer with Peter LaSalle, and we put together the anniversary shows, and those were primetime compilation uh, highlights from the, the past year. And if we didn't do 30, 40 share, we thought we were, we were, we were not doing very good at all. That's amazing. That's amazing <laughs> when you think about it today. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just completely different. And when I started the show... I made a deal with the producer, with Freddie, that he wouldn't tell anybody who I was. And basically, we did the show on Thanksgiving one one year, and I was backstage watching Johnny get on, uh, go on under the camera, go on through the curtain. And he turned to me and he said, I'll see you in about an hour. And then he walked through the curtain, and everybody turned to me and said, why are you going to see Johnny in about an hour? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like that, that though, that, that, that you made that agreement. Because, you know, <clears throat> you don't want that special treatment. You want to, And that says a lot about you. You want to work hard and, and be a producer and not come along for the ride because you're a family member. You want to work hard and, and earn your stripes. And that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, and I think it I think it makes it easier to deal with the with the staff and the crew because, you know, they know you've got a great deal and they know you're a privileged person. So um I was grateful that, that Fred allowed me to do that and Fred was probably hoping that I would have uh, my summer job and then leave and then I never left. So <laughs> <laughs> What was a if I may ask, a typical day at the Tonight Show? How would that roll? It was a super well oiled machine. So, you know, basically the writers were there early, um, and there was a group of writers who created the monologue. There was a group of writers who did what they called that desk spot. So that's like Karnak or little material reading spots they would do after the monologue. Um, the writers would then uh, put all the monologues together and bring them to the receptionist desk, which I was at the time. And I'd put them in an envelope and call a messenger, and a messenger would, would come to the Tonight Show and uh, drive the monologues out to Johnny's house, if you can believe that. I mean, we didn't have a computer on the Tonight Show at all, even when we even when we went off the air in 1992. Is that right? Okay, okay. So, and then the talent coordinators and the rest of the production staff would come in around <clears throat> 10 o'clock, and they would have a booking meeting from uh, uh, between 10 and noon, and that's when they would they would book talent and make calls and figure out what the day would be like. And then there was a production meeting with the staff and the crew at noon. Uh, we would have lunch between noon and like one and there was rehearsal at two and band rehearsal at three and the show was started at five thirty on the money and uh when i first started it was 90 minutes so it was five thirty to seven wow. and then it was five thirty to six after uh <clears throat> after 1980 and it was you know it was live you know you didn't stop you didn't do any retakes it was live and it was really really exciting that's why i think made that so show special is because you 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 taped it as if it was live what time would johnny get in he would get in at like two thirty, you know, two o'clock. Sometimes he'd come early, but most of the time he was, he was, you know, if he had to do a sketch or if he had to come in and do some uh, some publicity work. But you know, by the time I started on the show, it was already 
you know, 15 years in, he was kind of done doing publicity and uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he had it down. He knew, he knew what he was doing. Well, we are talking to Jeff Satsing. Jeff is the president of Carson Entertainment and Johnny Carson's trusted nephew. Johnny Carson, by the way, airs weeknights on Antenna TV. And we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of Johnny's final Tonight Show. And there's more after this on 720 WGN. As you know, the San Diego Zoo is one of the finest zoos in the world. And we've had this young lady on the show very often the past, uh, I guess, seven or eight years. She's been appearing with about us. Nine years. Hmm? About nine years. Right, yeah. Several plus several will be about nine. You said seven or eight. No, I said, been... no, I didn't say seven or eight. I said several. Then you said seven or eight, and I said oh, did it's I? nine. Yes. Nine, nine. Good, thank you. Yeah. Some of the animals, some of the animals you had as babies are now ten years old. That would be about right. Um, Remember the animals that did something funny on your tie? Yes. Those little lions, the little baby lions, were one year old. That's right. They are now treacherous and ferocious ten-year-old animals. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, Joan, uh, Joan Embry is here tonight. <laughs> and she's now 32. That's right. Uh, Joan is an, an animal uh, handler and a trainer. And uh, you, you really think you're fooling everybody, don't no, you? No, 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 no. Uh, and she I'm also, just here to do my best to help so you. I know that. And she does her three horse shows a day. Did you know that? At the animal park. Boy. <laughs> what? What an exciting idea. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like an army cot or something? Maybe just to kind of no. catch up on a little, no, 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 na- no, little no. nappy poo? Just might no, snap no, no, you no, right no. out of it. Okay. I love Joan. I'm the only one who went down to see Joan. Doc has never seen her. You've never seen her. I went to the Wild Animal Park. It's all right. It's all right. It's okay. But you're upsetting me. No, no. I don't want to upset you. I went down, Joan, and I I know you did. That's all right. It's all right. Don't say... What? I don't... I know her. I went down there. Oh, I know you did. I I, I know you went down there. I held a baby gorilla. I couldn't go with you that week. You held a baby gorilla. Good. All right. That was a clip of The Tonight Show in 1977 with Johnny and Ed McMahon after Ed had a few too many cocktails at lunch. It's Dave Plyer back with you on 720 WGN. We're talking to one of Johnny's original producers, his nephew and president of Carson Entertainment, and that is Jeff Satsing. You told me a story once about one day when Johnny was driving in from Malibu, and sometimes that drive was one to two hours to get to the Burbank Studios, and you made him an offer that he did refuse. This was toward the very end of his career when he was making a lot of money. Um, and he had been caught in L.A. traffic during a storm, and it took him maybe two hours to get in, and he was not a happy camper. <laughs> I bet. And, and I said, hey, you know, um, I'm a private pilot. He is a private pilot. I said, let me research what it would take to have a helicopter uh, pick you up somewhere near your house in Malibu, and I know you can fly right to NBC because they have a KNBC news helicopter that sits out there all the time, so I'm, we have a landing pad, so let me figure it out. So sure enough, I, I figure it out. It's it's great. And I, I go to see him a couple of days later, and he says, did you find out about the helicopter? I said, yeah, it's, it's incredible. It takes 15 minutes. They pick you up at like 145, 2 o'clock, you're here. You finish your show at, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock. They, they take you home. 7.15, you're home. It's great. And he says, uh, well, what would that cost? And I said, uh, it's uh, it's $600 each way. <laughs> and there was this long pause, and he looked at me and he said, Jeff, Jeff, who would spend $600 or $1,200 to go to work every day? What kind of person does this? Oh, Jeff, come on. I mean, I'd heard about it for a month. <laughs> but you know what? He's a guy that was making $25 million probably a year, but that was the Midwest guy in him. So Ed McMahon had a you know a chauffeur, uh, uh, a limousine, uh, and Johnny drove himself. Yeah. You know, so... That was funny. Did he have a pretty good, yeah. you know, I know Ed McMahon worked with him on Who Do You Trust on ABC and brought him over to The Tonight Show. What was the relationship like between the two of them? I know they were probably pretty close in the earlier days, but as time went on, did they just see each other on the show? Like, how did that dynamic work? I think that they were uh, much closer socially in the beginning. But, you know, these guys worked together for 40 
some years, you know. Yeah, yeah. So there was Ed McMahon, of course, and then and then Skitch Henderson was the music director until Doc came along. Uh, we met. Right. I met Doc this week, and he's eighty nine. And my God, first of all, he looks fabulous, and he's even more fabulous in person. I mean, it it was just a, such an honor to meet him. But what a great dynamic between these three guys for so many years on this show. Yeah, it really clicked. I mean, they had, Johnny and Skitch had a really good relationship too, but but Doc was even. Was even had an even better relationship with with Johnny and the crazy outfits that, that happened in the late sixties were just perfect fodder for him during the the monologue and you know again you, you think about the music that's involved in that show it was just insane uh, you know you have to do the theme and you have to do all the bumper music and you have to do all the guests I mean it's a lot of work and, and you know and, and he, they you know the, the Tonight Show band the Tonight Show orchestra they backed up everybody from you know Pavarotti to ZZ Top it was incredible. It was fantastic. And I was watching Doc um, over by one of the speakers in the museum uh, this past uh, uh, week, uh, like just sitting there up close, listening to the music and just tapping his foot. <laughs> it was pretty cool. So he says to me, you know, with Sean Compton from Antenna TV was so smart. He decided to have a compilation of all Doc's music playing in the background when we went up for the exhibit. And Doc says to me, hey. This music is really good. Instead of you, don't you, you realize? You go, oh yeah, this is really good. <laughs> I would love to, and I know there's rights issues with everything, but man, that would be great to throw out some some music on a disc or on, on Apple iTunes or something with all of. I know he's done a couple albums, but all that music, man, that he did is is classic. Like you, ne- you'll never see an orchestra like that on television again. I don't think. Well, no, and, you know, people forget that in the 60s and 50s, uh, CBS and ABC and NBC all had, uh, the you know, their own orchestra. The, it's, the, the Tonight Show Band is not the Tonight Show Band. It's Doc Severson and the NBC Orchestra. That's, that, that's the title. And if you did a special, like, you know, Dean Martin did the Gold Diggers, or you did Hullabaloo, or you did Laugh-In, you hired the NBC Orchestra, and they, they were right there. You know, really funny well, you say that. We had a, we had at this radio station for probably 30 years from the 1930s through the 60s, we had a WGN orchestra that would play on right. the air here. I mean, it's wild. But that every station had something like that, but not anymore. That's a, that's kind of something that's gone by. Well, yeah. And in the, in the 70s, you know, they got rid of everybody. ABC and CBS got rid of these guys. And yeah, I'm sure that NBC wanted to get rid of them. And Johnny said, no, that's... That's my kind of music, and I love that. And we're going to keep the band. And you know, you talk to Doc, and he will tell you that that was the greatest thing that ever happened to him to have a gig, a gig for thirty years. Yeah, uh, you know that is so regimented that he can go out and do weekend gigs, and even a lot of those guys play gigs at night. So that's a great deal. What guests did uh, Johnny really look forward to having on the show? You know, I, I it's something that always was like a great experience, not only for him but for the audience as well. Who did he enjoy having on? He loved people who came on and were prepared. Um, so Steve Martin would always come out and have a piece of material that would be dropped in. You know, Bette Midler, you know, especially you look at the, the show from May 21st, 1992. She does these unbelievable numbers. Just super, super prepared, professional people. Um, he really liked that. You know, Rodney Dangerfield. Rodney Dangerfield, uh, we'd ask him to come on the show, you know, twice a year. And he'd say, no, 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 just once because he wanted to be prepared. And he had his material that he would do center stage, and then he had his material that he would do at the panel. And, you know, Johnny just, you watch him with these guys, and you can see that he's just having a great time. And one of the things that he was so good at was helping direct these these performers on there with their material. So he could set them up, and they all, you know, Joan Rivers would talk about how, how wonderful Johnny was at setting up the comedian. How hot was it? How was your How's your health? Your health okay? Okay, good. I think doing <laughs> you just set him up. Well, he let people shine. I mean, it wasn't all about him. He he let his guests shine. If he really liked you, he really opened the door for you, and like, especially the comedians that were on that show. Yeah, I and mean, he told me that Jack Benny had told him once that you know, no matter what happens on the show, you're going to get the credit. So just make the show look good. Well, more with President of Carson Entertainment Jeff Satsing on the legacy of his uncle Johnny Carson. Right after this on seven twenty WGN. <laughs> No, uh, ah, boo. Here, here's your boo. <laughs> boo anyway, yeah, uh, boo this. Now, worst place. that's worst an Italian place. expression for how's the family. <laughs> John, I, I haven't been on with you for some time. It's you, been you've a been, long time. Yeah, well, you've been busy with other things. That's... <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, I heard the other party's story, and well, done. well, I'm going to help her get all we can get. <laughs> I only kid you, John, because, so. you know, you, 
your mother, your dad, your whole family, well, your father, rest his soul, he's yeah. gone, but your mother, you know, she, she did call me, and you're short again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, $50 a week and working as a house cleaner is a little out of <laughs> When you're a multi-millionaire sitting out at Malibu with those nine-year-olds going, little girl! <laughs> Well, you do kind of regress. Yes. That's true. Of course, we go back a lot of years. Oh, we do, do we ever? We know each other. I know. I know Ed. Uh, Sorry, brothers. Yeah, Ed. I used to be very close with, but he got too big. Yeah. Uh, he sits around now with his wife Victoria, going, "We're bigger than Johnny." <laughs> He's got shows all over. Star search, hunt your dog, look for your monkey, find your animal, go win a weekend, uh, seven weeks in El, so El Segundo. It's a whole thing, and he keeps telling me, "Isn't it a shame how Johnny's doing bad?" <laughs> I'm a friend. The guy knocks you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, look at this. Tommy Newsom and, and the other guy, uh, uh, Doc Sampson, went, We love you. We love you, Johnny. We'll do whatever you want. <laughs> They're all busy going, no. I don't have to do that. That's why I haven't been on in a great deal of time. <laughs> That's right. It's about two years since I started. You, mm, you, you, but I got the phone call and I started doing. Mm, I don't need you, Belch. I hope your beer truck blows up. Are you? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been? Have you ever been close to breaking up? My wife and I. No, your dog and you. Of course, your wife. Right. Yes. My dog and me. Yes, Barbara. Have I ever been close to breaking? I'll be very honest. I was more sensible than you. You got married when you were 12. Uh, you got married when you were 8. I was 20. I'm exactly. I was 25 the first time I Well, what did you know? You were out in Nebraska going, Strawberry shortcake, cockerberry pie, V, I, C, T, O, 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 Nebraska, Nebraska. What did you know? Well, you and got he was me. running around going, off we go into the wild blue yonder. He was a moron, too, and both of you have college educations. I never went to college. But I married don't... a wonderful Jewish girl that just lays there and says, Gucci, Gucci, Gucci. <laughs> well, you got married very late in life. Right. Because well, look you at did... the way I look. <laughs> but anyway, no, I got, because I knew, we both knew, no, I was in between marriages with you. Well, I, I, I was 38 before I got married. Well, you didn't you know that. You and, didn't. I, and I ran around. I, I was in heat for singers. Oh, ran around? Well, singers. Singers always knocked me out. But, but I knew it was over when I started carrying music. I saw music. some of those singers you had. Right? Yeah. Well, I've seen some of the girls. You went in between marriages, and they weren't exactly, you know, I've seen you with a couple of moose. But, uh, but in those days when you drank, you kept saying, you're gorgeous. No! No! I didn't go overboard with the other broad like <laughs> some of my black brothers that go, yeah, you know, yeah. Jews don't do that. They said, uh, well, start in a minute. I'm going to go get a paper. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you Irish guys go, and Victoria, is it over? <laughs> anyway, so, uh, no. One of the guests that I can watch over and over again on YouTube on the DVD collections that you sell from uh, from the archives is Don Rickles, uh, and and right. and I know it always looked like Johnny just didn't quite know what was coming from Don because Don is kind of an open book when it comes to coming on the show and so forth. But and I knew they knew each other for a long time, like from the days of Murray Franklin's and everything. That always was a treat, I think, when Don was on the show. Oh yeah, I mean he, you know, he was. Uh performing in Las Vegas in the lounge and, you know, Johnny and Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin, all these guys that were the headliners, they would go see Rickles at, you know, at the lounge after they did their shows. I mean, that, that was, that was the big deal. They loved to go see Rickles and, uh, uh, and maybe Louis Prima and Kelly Smith. I mean, all these guys, I mean, Keely Smith, I mean, they loved to see Rickles and, and Johnny and Rickles were working together from like the sixties. So yeah. it's amazing that yeah. they did that for so long. Now, I'm aware of one guest, because I've seen you talk about this before, that he had a little bit of a challenge with, and that was a fellow NBC personality, Bob Hope. Um, there, oh, okay. There, there, was a little, there was a little bit of frustration, because I think Bob would just kind of call up and say, hey, I'm coming over to do the show. He, and I noticed this as a kid, Jeff, Now, because you know, I was born in 67, so I missed a lot of the early years. But I remember when Bob would come on the show, there was just such a... You know, and he was Bob Hope. I I I, I, pl- I completely understand that. I, I respect who he is as a, as an actor, as a performer, as a comedian. But he always he, he always felt, seemed like he was in a rush. He always seemed like he had some place to go afterwards. I, I noticed this as a kid, and I always <laughs> noticed the clip packages he would bring about his specials looked like right. somebody taped them together 
and brought him into the studio. I knew that as a kid. I was like, what the right. hell is this? Am I right to say that? Is it, is it, was that Johnny's experience, too, with this? Well, you know, first of all, you know, Bob Hope was the biggest star of radio, yep. uh, film, and television. And when Johnny was a kid, Bob Hope was a big star. Yeah. So because of that, and because of Bob Hope's relationship with NBC, he could head carte blanche. He could do whatever he wanted. He'd come on whatever he wanted. And there was times when we had our show formatted and ready to go, and Bob wanted to come on tomorrow. Bob wants to promote his special tomorrow. And, okay, so you have to reschedule the whole show. You have to rework everything, and then we say make sure that the clip is no longer than two minutes, and the clip would be five minutes. And oh, I think that frustrated him, but, you know, he had such... Uh, you know, admiration and respect for Bob Hope. It, you know, it just it just frustrated him more than anything else. It, it didn't really upset him. Believe me, he was very upset when he passed away too. That was. Awful. I bet. I bet. I bet. Jeff, there are not many, if any, full shows from the 1960s, except some excerpts. Is that correct? That's correct. It's because it was a common practice to re-record uh, over the shows to save money for the tape. So there was, hard to believe. yeah, so it was never, never saved. And so there's pictures, even from the first show, there's audio, which I find really interesting of the first show, but just pictures, but, but everything really from the days in Burbank from 72 to 92 have been archived. And that's something that you convinced Johnny to do. Well, when the show moved from, from uh, New York to Burbank in 1972, they decided to put together a, an anniversary special. And that's when they realized they did not have all this material and that it had been destroyed. At first, they said it would be destroyed. It took us a long time to figure out that, no, it was actually re- reused. Nobody wanted to cop that, but it had been it had been reused. So Johnny was uh, powerful enough to say uh, to NBC at that time, you know, I want to have possession of all this material. I want to make sure that nothing is destroyed from now on. And by the time I got there, um, I got involved in the, these anniversary specials, and that's when it, we needed to actually create a a database and, you know, buy a computer. We bought a computer like with DOS 1.0 and a very primitive spreadsheet and started to build out this this database, which actually we still use today. That's how we're able to find all these shows and see these shows, and it's, it's a terrific thing. But he was just, just had the vision to say, let's protect us. He, I don't, he never expected it to be as successful as it was, but uh, he definitely had some vision. Which is brilliant. Um, I don't think people really know where they're stored. Tell, tell people how and where these are stored. <laughs> they are all in a salt mine in Kansas, in Hutchinson, Kansas. And basically, this this mine that was a, a huge mine that's used to mine salt that is that is sprayed over the roads in the in the winter. And after years and years of this mining operation, they had this basically a vault that is about the size of 250 football fields. It's 200 and some feet below the wow. surface of the earth. It's flood proof. It's uh, it's fireproof. It's the same humidity. It's the same temperature and uh, there had been a, uh, a fire right next to the warehouse where our tapes were stored in L.A., and the people from underground vaults and storage in Hutchinson came to us and said, you know, we have this facility, and we'll make you a great deal. So not only did, was it great for us to be able to move it to uh, Kansas for security, but when they did that, then uh, they had to barcode everything, and when they barcoded everything, then I had a really good idea of what we had. So, I mean, there's... There's probably 100,000 pieces of videotape in the vault. It's amazing. Wow. And you have to take oxygen and stuff to go down there. I mean, this isn't something you just walk into underground. Well, it's an operating mine. They're still mining. So uh, if you go into a mine, you need to have a breathing device with you in case they, you know, cut into a vein of methane or something that's lethal. So it's, yeah, you have to wear a hard hat. It's, it's a little hairy. I'm sure it is. Well, you can catch all these great episodes that Jeff and his team have brought to Antenna TV every weeknight. You can also get The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. All kinds of collections, full episodes, a lot of content, and, and much more at one of your websites. JohnnyCarson.com. There you go. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. Absolutely. And I, I will tell you, it, it was a pleasure meeting you. I am, I'm thrilled and uh, excited that Johnny was smart enough to put a guy like you in charge of his legacy. And you've done such a wonderful job with it. And thank you for sharing it with us, because now we can see it again every single night. Thank you, Dave. My pleasure. Dave WGN. Our celebration continues on the 30th anniversary of the final airing of The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson back in 1992. And on stage with him was legendary band leader and trumpeteer, the iconic Doc Severinsen. Doc, can you believe it's been 30 years since the last time you were on stage with Johnny? Well, if you want to know the truth, to me, it seems like it was a couple of weeks ago or maybe yesterday. I don't know. 
you began with NBC really much longer before The Tonight Show. I mean, it was o- over a decade. It was like 1949. How did the gig come about with NBC that you got your first contract? Well, let's see. It was the Kate Smith Show, which was one of their staples in the beginning. And she was on five afternoons a week wow. at uh, 4 o'clock. And um, so... The show had been on a year or so, and they wanted to make a change in the band, and I was invited to come and be the first trumpet player on the show. And um, so uh, I did it, and it was just the equivalent of doing a local show at that time because the network really only consisted of of the five O-N-O stations, you know, like yeah. Chicago, New York, L.A., and so on and so forth. Sure. And... Um, then uh, they, it became apparent that television was really going to be here to stay, mm-hmm. uh, and then they started adding stations. I, I noticed that when Steve Allen came and, and did the Tonight Show, uh, it, it was a local show in New York, and um, they Sorry. called it something else, probably Open House or something. And uh, Steve Allen took over the show and. I, I can remember as clear as like it was yesterday. Uh, well, welcome to the show tonight, folks. And guess what? We got station, whatever, whatever, whatever ah. in Schenectady, New York, is joining <laughs> the NBC family. Wow! And uh, it, it, it every night they added, and I That's was cool. sitting there in the band watching a network be born. So you were always there from the beginning, but it was five years later. Skitch decided to leave the show. Was there a reason that he decided to step down? Was it enough for him? Did he just do, you know, just exactly what he wanted to do and he was ready for a change? Had, he had other things he wanted to do. Gotcha. And and um, so he did them. And um, uh, Johnny, uh, you know, everyone thought I would was going to be the heir apparent, and, and uh, as it turned out, a wonderful gentleman by the name of Milton Deluck took over the band. And Milton was just a beautiful guy and, and a damn good musician and had experience on the Broadway Open House. And um, it after about a year of that, I was uh, on a tour with Johnny doing a weekend in Baltimore. And the producer of the show came up to me and said, "Hey, uh, Johnny wants you to come back and take over the show. He 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 misses having you there." And uh, hmm. or how however he put it, yeah. And, and uh, I saw I uh, was just getting ready to say, "Well, I'm pretty busy. <laughs> you know, I got a lot of dates." And I said, "Yes, of course, I'll be there." And I had no idea what that was going to be like. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, and here's the thing, too, about that. I'm sure Johnny noticed, you know, that there was some good chemistry between the two of you. Because, I mean, it was so obvious on the show that it's not, you know, for a job like that, it's not just being a great band leader. It's it's about having... You, some... you got it? You got it? Yeah. Johnny, one of Johnny's favorite uh, people in show business was Jack Benny. He liked yes. the way Jack Benny did his show, where he had Phil Harris was the band leader. Yeah. You knew he was the band leader. He even had Frankie Remley, the guitar player, as part of the cast of yeah. characters. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, of course, Don Wilson was the announcer. And uh, so Johnny wanted a show where he could have other people and spread it around a little bit and not put so much pressure on himself and wear it out in five minutes. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, totally. Um, so that was... I never for one minute thought, well, I'm, you're leading the band for the Tonight Show because Johnny thinks I'm the best player around. Uh, it never occurred to me. I knew why I was there. Well, we are talking to the legendary Doc Severinsen. It's the 30th anniversary of the final Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. And there's more with Doc after the top stories from the Northwestern Medicine Newsroom. What was that last note you hit on? Was that it? What was that last note on the trumpet? 
was a B flat concert. High B flat concert. And it flat. hurts. <laughs> Is that the highest note you can hit on the trumpet? No, it depends on what happened the day before. <laughs> but that's a high note, high B flat, right? Yeah. You're getting in the danger zone with Try, that. Do, do the high B flat again and then see, see if you can go above it. <laughs> Do the high B flat and do then you sneak. have any idea? <laughs> no, I don't. What I you're asking me to do? <laughs> I know. It, do it, Twenty-three well, years, you've never asked me anything. Well, that takes <laughs> that takes great embouchure, as they say, right? Let's hear it, Doc. Great embouchure. You, can you want an, uh, sneak up to the uh, sneak sneak on up? Well, d- <laughs> can't can we have the whole band play? No, I don't want to cover over this. <laughs> I want to just clean. Stay player on 720 WGN. We're celebrating the 30th anniversary this weekend of the final episode of The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. And we're talking to music legend Doc Severinsen. Johnny Carson airs uh, weeknights on Antenna TV. And I was pretty young when, uh, you know, those first 20 years that the show aired. But this was a show that was the pulse of pop culture, TV, movies, music, sports, politics. It is a virtual history lesson in every single show. You're so right. It is a history lesson, but it isn't a history lesson about show business or television. Mm -hmm. It's a a history lesson about America. You guys had great conversations when he would look to his left and come out of the curtain and just talk to you during the monologue or whatever it was. By the way, always wanted to see what you were wearing. That was that was always the highlight. Even as a kid, I was like, what does this man have on today? Because you had some cool stuff, man. Well, and- one night I remember I thought, you know, every night I'm coming out in a wild outfit or something that's supposed to be a little different. And I'm tired of that. Jesus, I can't, I can't shop enough. <laughs> and and uh, I said, I'm just going to put on a regular suit. So I wore a blue suit and a regular tie. And and when the show was over, Johnny walked into his dressing room. And as I'm told by the producer, he said, well, what in the hell was with that blue suit that Doc had on tonight? For God's sake, what is that? <laughs> And and the next night, or the next afternoon when I came to work, the producer said, "Uh, no more blue suits. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. That's great. When when I met you, we were walking through the Carson exhibit, and we had one of your wild uh, outfits in a showcase. And this was fabulous. We walked over to it together, and you looked at it, and you kind of stared at it for a little bit. And you put your hand on your chin, and you just looked at it for really silence for about two minutes. And you turned to me, and you said, I wondered where this suit went. (laughs) <laughs> which was so, which was so much fun but that was you know you had quite a flair for fashion over the years and again you know the conversations you and johnny had and of course my favorite was uh when the topic of thanksgiving came up i was going to ask you if you got your turkey yet sure do you uh, truthfully do you help mrs carson prepare the turkey just like you helped Mrs. Severinsen prepare the turkey. Uh, no, there, there is no Mrs. Severinsen. Oh, that's right. There, right. That, right I, there used to be. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. In fact, the fact that I never helped her track. stuff her bird was one of our big problems. <laughs> I thought that was your problem. Well, no, you know, I forgot all about that. We've been together so long that I forget sometimes where we are. <laughs> Which wife are we on? On, on various Thanksgivings. Uh, oh, no. no, we're going to... Well, In fact, that was one of the things we really fought about. What? Did you I really wanted an oyster stuffing in the turkey, and she wanted bread stuffing, <laughs> and she got bread stuffing and a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you used to argue about what you're going to stuff the turkey with? Yes. And that was one of the problems. She's still stuffing the turkey with, no, the with money. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to know you have no bitterness. <laughs> 
Well, I always used to say, uh, you know, I mean, you can have turkey and all that. I don't like turkey that much. Yeah. I said, I love lasagna. She calls up every year at Thanksgiving and says, are you having your lasagna? <laughs> <laughs> they don't forget, do they? No. Uh, don't I suppose bet. you'll be home with the family having <laughs> turkey. <laughs> Just a typical American family. That's right. If you really feel badly now, I feel so terrible that you're going to be alone. Would you, would you like... I didn't say I was going to be alone. <laughs> you just said you ain't going to eat no turkey, right? That's right. Uh, you can come over there. Would you like to come to the house? And uh... This is the first time you've ever asked me. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you made me feel so guilty. I mean... I mean, you, when you ask an employee in front of 15 million people, do you want to come to the house for Thanksgiving? What am I going to say? No. You know what I say? I say, yes, Mr. Carson, I love it. Can you come? No. Doc, I got to tell you, what a pleasure it has been uh, to hang out with you a little bit. Um, it, you're, it's your legend, man, and, I, and, and it's a thrill for me. Well, it's very kind of you to say that, and uh, I appreciate the time, the chance, you know, reminisce a little bit. And uh, of course, at this time of the year, I'm doing a lot of that. And yeah, uh, yeah. I just got to tell you one final thing, and it's that as I go through life and I'm challenged, in some particular way, I always stop and ask myself, usually about a matter of how should I behave about this or that or some other thing. And I think, okay, what would Johnny Carson do mm-hmm. in this situation? And I go by that, and, and it usually turns out to be right. Wow. Uh, <laughs> until the time I had an appointment who was with the witch doctor, and, and then it didn't work too well. <laughs> nice. Nice. Very nice. I like that you channel Johnny for that, though. That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. And uh, I will never forget exactly where I was and so so forth when I heard about that Sunday morning. It was about 7.30 in the morning, and I was taking a shower, and and I heard my wife let a yelp out, and I got out of the shower, and said, what the hell's going on? What was that about? She says, well, I don't know how to tell you this, but Johnny just died. Yeah. And Jeff Sotsing had called to let her know, and uh, I, my life changed at that moment. I mean, it it was not just something that happened and you get over. Uh, I'll always remember that as one of the seminal moments in my life. I think I felt that emotion and saw it in your face. Uh, the very next night, I think you were in New York on that Monday, I think, with David Letterman um, and Tommy Newsom. Uh, and Ed Shaughnessy, and playing that tribute um, to Johnny on stage. And I remember how emotional, not only that, it was exhausting watching that show, um, seeing all of you together doing that for Johnny. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And now, now Eddie Shaughnessy and Tommy Newsom are going. Yeah. And uh it, Kind of makes me wonder. Well, does anybody have any idea when it's my turn? <laughs> and, Hopefully, uh, a long yeah. time from now, Doc. Hopefully, a long well, time from now. Um, it could be. It could be. But I don't. I don't. I don't think about it. How long? But how good is the time going to be in, in the meantime? That's right. And uh, that's about the best any of us can do. And I sure do. I appreciate it chance to talk to somebody about all of this that we discussed. Well, it was an honor so, for me. Uh, thank you. No, thank you for taking time. Million. Absolutely. I'll thank you, Doc. We'll I'll see, see you on the scene. Dave Fire, WGN. 
But I wax nostalgic on Lincoln's birthday. Every Lincoln's birthday, I reminds me of my old girlfriend back in Nebraska. Gina's statutory. <laughs> Name was Gina statutory, and uh, she went to Lincoln High, and she was voted Miss Lincoln because uh, every guy in school took a shot at her in the balcony. <laughs> Chicago's own Bill Zamey, who is one of the most successful and influential magazine writers and biographers of his generation, conducted an exclusive post-Tonight Show interview with the legendary Johnny Carson. And to take a comprehensive look at Johnny's life in and out of show business and share that conversation, the man that knows more about Carson than anybody else is the amazing Bill Zamey. Hey, Bill. You're the only other one, actually. You and me. <laughs> we got it down. No, you know who we might. one is? Is, is a gentleman named... Uh, runs antenna tv over there uh and i don't even know if they're affiliated anymore with the wgn world oh we are whatever. Uh, oh yeah they are good good well it's again it's it's you know uh antenna tv every night we get johnny again i mean johnny has been missing we've only had we've only had these little crummy compilation things but now we're getting the whole show for the most part uh, with a few little caveats here or there, but the, this is the work of uh, a fellow named Sean Compton. Sean Compton, his, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's 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 the magic man. He's the uh, he he would uh, you know he likes to challenge me in my Carson knowledge. Is that right? I am superior. <laughs> I am vastly superior. However, he knows the sh- <laughs> he knows things that happen on certain shows that would take me you know at least a Google search. Wow, that's pretty cool. I, and it is cool. I'll, I'll tell you, Bill, too. Watch it, like, live and breathe in real time uh, and see some of the – I mean, he. what it told me was he is just a master in every interview. It's a, it's it's fascinating to just look at the power he exudes, and it's and it's uh, it, it's it's not an a, uh, uh, you know it's not an obnoxious power. It's a comforting one. He's like he's so in charge of our psyche, and and this is you know it, it, at the time he was he was in charge of our psyche, but you can kind of see why now. You know, I yeah, mean, yeah. you can say sure now we got a million choices, and you can flip around and see anything, and you hit Johnny, and you're going to think. Well, this is going slow. Uh, and then you start realizing, wait, he's doing all this himself. Everything all the boys do today with all their, you know, drop-ins and, uh, you know, and, and visual, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, footage and things like that. Johnny didn't have footage. He held up cards. He never had any pictures of the monologue, you know, and all of the boys do now. You know, it's been yeah. going on for, for quite a while. Uh and not that there's anything wrong with that. It's a different time, but it's it's an amazing thing to to behold uh, uh, the monologue itself. Anyway, but, it, it, but beyond that, just the way he interacts with people is it's it's fascinating, you know. But you talk about the boys, and there's been a couple iterations of late night hosts already since Johnny left, and I and, and it just shocks me when I've told people this past week what I was going to do this weekend on my show and said it was 25 years ago that he signed off. It, it really does seem unreal. You know, uh, I was in the room when that happened. Wow. I, 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 I was able to uh, coerce a friend of mine. Actually, a friend of mine uh, was representing Doc Severinsen, a, a, a PR guy named Howard Bragman. And, you know, to him, I always have to you know, throw, throw his name in. <laughs> but, yeah, sure. In fact, you always see Howard turn up on, if, if something goes wrong uh, with, with a celebrity, somebody goes haywire and drives into a truck or, uh, or they come out or whatever, this is the guy you go to and you see him on wow. CNN. It's money wow. in the bank, gotcha. Howard Bragman. But yeah, but back then he was, he was a lowly celebrity publicist, among other things, and, and uh, Doc was a client, and I was able to, uh, you know, come on the t- the extra ticket Howard had and watch. I had never actually, now I had uh, been in the sidelines watching Johnny do the show uh, weeks earlier, in fact. I'd gotten access in the final weeks for Rolling Stone wow. to be able to go sort of wander around for a few days behind the scenes of the Tonight Show, which was an unheard of thing. And, I bet. And, uh, and it's, uh, it was uh, fascinating. And I, that's where I met uh, and became friends with Jeff Sotzing, who you've had on the program. Sure. Who now, you know, oversees all, all things Carson, uh, the empire. Yeah. He's the prince. He is. He, he is the prince. <laughs> he is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he is definitely the prince. And uh, he's a great guy. He's uh, been 
you know, awfully helpful to me over the years uh, in, in my research. And geez, in the time since I started this project, he's been able to digitize the entire library and uh, have it all uh, indexed now with transcripts that you can read along the Wow, I did not know that. Wow. And yeah, I it's, a, it's an astonishing uh, yeah. uh, research gift, you know, and uh, I, when I had started, frankly, uh, not long after Johnny had passed away, but, but I was depending on the most avid fans, the kind of fans who would be up at this hour listening to this. <laughs> those are those kind of fans. That's right. You, know, you bet. Who, 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 who do watch Antenna TV, and there are they are out there, boy, and... Uh, I, I bless them all because they found ways to to start taping Johnny back before anybody had any tape. Yeah, uh, uh, you know it. Uh, there, I think there was a brief period where you could order for like a hundred bucks any episode you wanted. A lot of people did that for some reason or another. Uh, usually, the celebrities you know who had been on uh, also got tapes, and I think generations spun off into the world so that there are all these collectors you know i bought a few and, uh, of them too i i found the yeah. ones that had rickles on them and stuff and i i eBay, bought them for my right? own right no i bought them from the well whatever jeff's website was originally of oh, selling you, all oh, this you, stuff oh yeah no oh this is go yeah but this oh did you actually that far you did it a long time ago yeah then, huh? yeah i did i you, did you so you dropped a hundred bucks here i there. did <laughs> i did i did yeah I'm sharing my interview with Bill Zamey on The Legend of Johnny Carson on the 30th anniversary of Johnny's final Tonight Show. And there's more after the news next on 720 WGN. And so it has come to this. I uh, am one of the lucky people in the world. I found something I always wanted to do, and I have enjoyed every single minute of it. I want to thank the gentleman who shared this stage with me for 30 years, Mr. Ed McMahon. (laughs) Mr. Doc Severinsen. You people watching, I can only tell you that it has been an honor and a privilege to come into your homes all these years and entertain you. And I hope when I find something that I want to do and I think you will like and come back that you'll be as gracious inviting me into your home as you have been. I bid you a very heartfelt good night. We were talking about uh, Johnny and his and his wife, Alex. You know, that was his fourth wife. Um, and you said you were kind of courting her to, to talk about her for the book. He was married, uh, you know, before he even uh, started uh, Carson Seller and and uh, Who Do You Trust and some of those other shows in the 1950s. Is Joan still alive, by the way, his first wife? His first wife, uh, last I heard, I, okay. uh, last I heard she was uh, okay. alive. She's sort of a missing link. Yeah. Uh, she's, she's had sort of a troubled life and... Uh, uh, yeah, kind of an itinerant woman. It's not, it's a peculiar story, but I don't think she, you know, uh, she, I, she didn't really have relationships with the sons so much anymore. You know, Johnny, had, they had three sons together. Right. Her name was Joan, but she went by Jody. But the funny thing is her name was Joan. And then of course, uh, uh his next second wife was Joanne. Yeah, and, uh, and the third one, <laughs> right, Joanna. Yeah. Joanna was the third one, and then uh, and then somewhere in between, uh, Joan Rivers came along and broke his heart, and he married an Alex. <laughs> That's, <laughs> he just, right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But you know, you talk about his, his wives was uh, Joanne. Uh, the, yeah, jo- jo- Joan Rivers broke his heart. Obviously, that, that a different way, but yes. for, for bailing out and uh, jumping ship and, and not telling him. him. Yeah. It, and anyone who tries to defend that woman, including herself, uh, from you know that charge, it, 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 you're, you're, it's just incorrect because she did. They were so close. He so if you, you know, sometimes you can see on antenna if Joan Rivers is a guest how much Carson loves her. Oh, just as a, as a, yeah. as he dotes on her and he feeds her and he's just delighted by her at all times. And so when she really, I mean, had every opportunity to mention this to him well in advance, but she, she, you know, she claims, well, she did before she told the press. It was the same day she told the press. She tried to call Johnny, and he already knew, of course, yeah. by then, and, and dropped the phone back on the hook and never really forgave her for that because uh, it just, and, it's, it, and that's a shame, and I don't know if that speaks well of him. I don't know, but I don't think she really tried all that hard to say, you know, I screwed up here. 
I talked to Joan. I talked to Joan a couple months before she passed, and we talked a little bit about that. And she she expressed you know remorse. And I know she has in other shows too that she never she never did that. But Johnny didn't trust a lot of people, and with probably with good reason. Um, you know, he had to keep his circle probably relatively tight. And Joan was well, in that circle, did. right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, look at look at look at the betray. He was Johnny found found ways to you know, bring people close to him who were very good at betraying him. Uh, and, and, of course, the greatest example is Bombastic Bushkin, yeah. his attorney who wrote uh, Henry Bush Bushkin, who wrote a memoir about, you know, working for Johnny. He left out all the parts about the where, where, where the money flowed and, and, yeah. and why Johnny was kind of concerned about maybe – you know the honesty and trust factor anymore, and let him go. Uh, but uh, that's all left out. But anyway, the funny thing about that, that book is it's sort of a horrible thing to write if you're his I read best it. friend. It is terrible. You're his best friend and attorney, and he always likes to make fun of me when he hears because he, I've been working on this book for a long time. It's sort of legendary. It's out there in Carson land, and believe me, it's uh, I've had a a really good. Uh, reason for for having lost uh, the thread of it especially over the last uh, three or four years here but uh but it, it will be back and we're, we are going to get this thing out there but anyway but he always he mocks me as a sycophant and i i don't think i'm a sycophant i do love donnie carson but i also know as you'll see in that uh, in that uh, you know american masters i i can kind of point out the parts where it hurts too you yeah know? And you I, absolutely and did I, yeah. I mean, Johnny, you know, the funniest thing is when I approached him for this Esquire piece that we did do back in 2002, that was the 10th anniversary of his departure. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, wow. and, I, and, and I did, and my, you know, argument to him then was, it's only going to be 10 years once, you know, and I, it's oddly, he sort of saw the merit in that. And, and also the fact that it's a lot easier to talk to a writer you know, uh, than to, you know, Interesting. go on a big show, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, it was what was especially uh, important was this was, uh, this you know, basically 9-11 had happened about five months earlier. So, uh, you know, September 11th of 2001. And so the world was completely still in, in sh- we were all in shock, you know, and we were all looking for a security blanket. And it occurred to me we were the, the, the most important security blanket America ever had was this guy. Yeah, it's true. Uh, for, for those thirty years, in a way that nobody else could be. Not you know, uh, Johnny tucked you in at night. I mean, uh, yeah, that's Walter right. Cronkite did, did not tuck you in at night, and right. I don't know that he would be a security blanket. Uh, so what uh, he sort of saw what that was you know what i was getting at there and it was a great time to talk to him and how long did how long did you spend with him how long did you spend with him bill oh well a couple few hours really i you know officially you know yeah initially yeah but uh you know uh, but there there was you know we were in touch and such but uh uh yeah i never did want to uh, you know publishers came to me and after the Esquire piece came out then and, and pushed me to do the you know biography, and I knew that that would not please him, although he did tell me at the time he didn't give a damn, I'm using a softer word, what anybody cared <laughs> or what anybody said about him anymore. You know, uh, it, it, it didn't matter, you know, because he'd done it. And he was perfectly at home with, with himself and his history, I think. More of my conversation with Bill Zamey on the legacy of Johnny Carson right after this on 720 WGN. Sis Boomba. Sis Boomba. (laughs) Describe the sound made when a sheep explodes. When you were uh, when you were a kid uh, watching the show, and I think we're about the same age. When you were a kid. And you'd look in the TV guide and see who was on. And I never could, you know, I was, you know, that was way past my bedtime in a lot of cases. And it was one of those moments you hear about that truly happened to me, too, is I'd stick around the corner. And, you know, my dad didn't know I was standing there, but I was watching 
Carson uh, with some of my favorite comedians. And I, I loved it when Dave Letterman was on in the 70s when he was doing stand-up or when he was filling in. I loved Rickles. I loved when the you know the old school guys or the Sinatras or the, or the Dean Martins. Angie Dickinson. I knew how cool that was when she was on there because Johnny would just flirt like a madman with this woman. You know, they had a thing. They yeah. did have a thing. They literally did have a thing, but yeah. not. But it was in between uh, their marriages. It was not anything untoward, uh, and it was just, I think, silly. She talked about it with me a bit, but he. Uh, uh, that was always great TV. Diane Cannon was another one. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, oh, you yeah. see the flirtation there. Uh, uh, um, Lonnie Anderson. Lonnie Anderson later on, Sally Field, the subs, uh, uh, you know, and she's later now in recent years talked about dating him for the first time, which wow. was, uh, uh, which I was always surprised because he was so he seemed so close to uh, Burt Reynolds, and this was post Burt Reynolds. And S- Sally Field, uh, she said she <laughs> jo- Johnny was very uh, you know amorous. He, he he put the moves on with great style. So she <laughs> said she felt like a little tadpole in the hands of an octopus or yeah. something. But, <laughs> but, uh, but what a cool octopus. Yeah. I don't know. It's funny. You know what I love? In the realm of women, you know, uh, Johnny, it was it was great to see the ones who would keep him on his toes. And the one who really did a great job was Suzanne Plachette. So oh. anytime you see her, <laughs> okay. uh, uh, I'll look for always that. worth it. Yes, always. <laughs> they had a, a they had an understanding. She was one of the boys to him, and he was able to just be himself. And they they, they knew each other off uh, camera quite well, uh, you know, and spent time there. The two couples, yeah. Johnny and his third wife and Suzanne Plachette and the. Uh, and her, well, she was married to a guy. Well, anyway, it's, it's, she, she later married Tom Poston right. after I think the other fellow passed away. Yeah, but, yep. but well, again, only people who listen to this show would know or care about that. <laughs> that's true. I think that's true. <laughs> so, so Johnny, you know, when he the, the night you you you're the afternoon you found out he he passed away. I mean, that must have just punched you in the gut because it did for me, and I think millions of Americans just. You talk about the the security blanket that went away when he when he got off the show, but then when you heard he passed, it was like, oh, wow! You know, it, it, it was like, no, you got to be kidding! And it just it was it was really a denial thing at first. I when I was getting called to go because I was, you know, when I did the Esquire piece uh, <clears throat> that forced me out to do an awful lot of other media to talk about being the guy who Johnny sat with, you know, and talked to. And uh, let profile, you know, let him uh, let me profile him. And so I had done, you know, the Today Show, and uh, you know, I don't even know what uh, O'Reilly. Don't ask. Who knew? Yeah, he seemed wow. to respect Johnny. But uh, uh, it, 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 but when he died, it was crazy. It was like he died. It was a Sunday, and uh, so all the news gathering. You know, they were all gearing up for Monday, and at the same time, I had to do whatever could be done for the day itself. Uh, but really, the next day, Monday, I was all over the place again. Jeez. I bet. I bet. And I think Letterman. And just, well, and it, well, that's a surreal thing. It doesn't make sense. I, I, when I say that, it looks like it sounds like I'm, I'm proud that I was out on all these shows. It's not that. It's just like that's the last thing you feel like doing when you lose somebody that important to you is yeah. to go out and have to talk about what he meant to everyone. And then I realized, well, I've had the privilege of paying really close attention to him in a way other people don't. You know, right. I've studied him. I've written yeah. about him. He's yeah. been a subject. This is somebody I've you know, had to try and crawl inside of as best one can. And uh, and that would only get more so in these years hence. But uh, so it was sort of my responsibility to go out there and just say, what could be said and and you know it, it just you, you add to a chorus of voices on days like that it is kind of those days when a celebrity passes they're, they're the strange days on television anymore aren't they yeah they are that's what i felt like when rickles passed away uh you know a couple oh, months yeah. ago same way um 25 years from now or i mean we're on the 25th anniversary of, of the last tonight show starring johnny carson 25 years from now what would you yes, say johnny's five years from now i will finish the book <laughs> that was my question oh wait oh, you had a different... oh okay. No, right. what okay. what do you think you know we're, we're talking generations later of him being off the air i mean where's his legacy going to be 25 years from now bill well i just hope 
I, I, I think, you know, uh, every new generation comes along and likes to look over his shoulder a, a couple decades mm-hmm. back at a time. And, you know, and sometimes they'll look back a couple decades back and see what they were interested in. And, and they were interested in something retro at that point. And it's like, I think this, uh, he, you know, I've always said he's never going to have the, uh, uh, the same, uh, unfortunately, and it's unfair, uh, the same chance to have the same legacy as, say, Sinatra. Because Sinatra is music, and it's and and, and mm-hmm. this is television, and it was of the moment at the time. Now it's fascinating to watch. It don't, don't do not be turned off by the fact that you, you know you're going to hear Watergate jokes. I mean, come on, how no, great is that? It is great. I mean, <laughs> learn is. about your country here. This is like the best history lesson totally you could possibly true. get. Totally true. It is, you're, you're learning about all these presidential administrations as filtered to you the way it was filtered to America through Carson, and he always had a handle on it and, and what they were all doing. He he went first. But he did something that the guys uh, nowadays, uh, I guess it's just, it'd be impossible. I would love to see Johnny Carson walk, uh, uh, you know, down the middle, you know, of, of Trump and see if he could survive that. <laughs> you always think about think, that, right? Yeah, think about that. When, know, when things happen in pop culture, what would Johnny, what would he be saying? What, was his, what would his monologue be about, right? Well, I'll tell you, the amazing Bill Zamey. Bill, I've always, again, wanted to chat with you on the air. Uh, thank you for making that happen. Thank you for taking the time tonight. I love, love, love your work and what you do. Big fan, man. Hey, same same goes for you. I love the you. I am one of your people. I am one of these people. <laughs> I'm that. a day flyer person. I I, you know, and I'm under <laughs> 60. Come on. <laughs> you are. You are. Thank you, Bill. I, I appreciate swear. it, buddy. Thank you, sir.